Good evening and welcome to CES 2019. You know, in just a few hours, our show floor will open to a world of innovation filled with technologies and solutions that are totally transforming our world. Hey, Chloe. Sorry, I forgot to introduce you. Everyone, this is LG Chloe Guidebot. You'll find a friend at airports assisting travelers, but he, she's here tonight to help me with my keynote, the first robotic co-speaker at a CES keynote. Hello, Vegas. It's great to meet you all. I'm sorry IP made you all surprised and worried. Well, don't worry, Chloe. I wouldn't have asked the question if I did not have the answer. Because you see, that's why we at LG are starting a new chapter in the story of electronics. And our answer is right here, artificial intelligence. And this idea of connection is what will also allow us to provide intelligent solutions at a much bigger scale, from buildings and factories to even cities. What's more important is that with the power of AI, we'll be able to connect individual units, your homes, cars, robots, and all your devices into an intelligent system. And we are already exploring what more, what more we can do at that level with smart city projects all around the world, in the US, in Canada, and in Korea. Our vision for a kind of AI that matters. It matters to you because it evolves by learning about you. It will also connect with you through a diverse portfolio of products designed for every aspect of your life. And our AI products will serve as an open platform where we'll work together with our partners to deliver best possible AI experience for our customers. And, that's, and with that kind of AI, our ambition is to take LG way beyond its current role as a leading manufacturer of consumer electronics. Our vision in the coming age of artificial intelligence is to become a lifestyle innovator that serves a truly intelligent way of living. So simply put, um, I'd like to share some of the innovation that I feel is so strong in IBM's DNA. And as I know this is a consumer show, we're not necessarily a consumer company. As I always say though, you don't always see us, but you do rely on us underneath. And so I want to end on this point that we, we codified at IBM something called Principles for Trust and Transparency. We try, we've lived by them, we try to live up to them every single day for our 108 years. And I thought in the spirit of New Year's resolutions, I'd share mine with you, these principles. I'd invite you to either adopt them or build your own. But the first one is that all of us that work on these technologies, that we always remember their purpose of these technologies is to augment man. It is not to replace man. We have a lot to do with that. The second is all that data that we've talked about, that ownership of data, the data in those insights, they belong to the owner. And with their permission, we use them. And the third is to ensure these technologies, you heard it, that they're open, they're transparent, but more than anything, that they're explainable and they are free of bias. For us, all here, all around the cloud, is really to see that we are using this chain and shape it in a direction that is actually transforming and doing good. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The 5G, which is the next era of technology advancement, it's going to be built on 5G. So this is really what it's all about, to build the best 5G network, which we are committed to do, but we need partners in all industries, by consumers, by businesses and society. You know, my view of the world is a problem is actually an opportunity. And so although we have some challenges, the opportunities that we face are much greater. And I know what's really important to us is coming together collectively as an industry working across boundaries with all the partners that we have, all the partners we have on stage, all the OEMs, we can turn the impossible to the possible. And at AMD, we're on that journey. We're on that journey to build a future 
where high-performance computing is at the foundation of what enables the smartest and the brightest minds to solve the world's toughest and most interesting challenges. Right now, we don't have self-driving cars. People are still their car's best safety feature, and they have to stay engaged in the task. And I would say one of the things that struck me this week is it's all about connecting vehicles to the home, putting assistance in the car. At the same time we're talking about whether or not self-driving is possible, we're also adding to the load of the driver in the car. Um, I think the, the, the harder part is, is what um, Amnon alluded to, is the under-regulation in the sense that um, we, we don't even know what's, what's an acceptable goal, right? Because safety doesn't have an upper limit. You can always do better. Um, but at, at some point, it's, it's good enough. You're saving 90% of the lives. You know, should you, you know, keep waiting until you have this next 10% and then in between people are dying, right? So it's, it's a real ethical question that it's not for me to answer. And um, if you tell me, you know, I need to do 90% good or 99% or 99999 it's very different products. So what, what do I tell my team today, you know, what, what to build on? I think, and that's where some guidance of, um, or, or some debate, or I don't know if it's from the, regulation, from the um, regulator or from some um, other social group, mm -hmm. uh, but, but some guidance of uh, what's uh, acceptable. So to, to enforce it, right, with driver monitoring, for example, if you need the driver to pay attention, there's driver monitoring system that will that will do this um, and, and and I think uh, you know like um, HMI um, studies have been done for a long time in, in the aviation industry for example but also in the automotive industry I mean there's there's definitely ways to to um, improve or, or, or you know make sure that uh, the the driver understands or the passengers depending who is what who is um, understands what is expected or not expected from him so, you know, what, what we did in, in Israel, we, we took an initiative. Uh, we built a joint venture with the Volkswagen to uh, start a mobility as a service, a, com a commercial deployment in 2022. And the question, why, why in Israel? You know, it's not natural to be the first place to enable mobility as a service. It's because the Israeli government, you know, committed that they'll build they'll create the right regulatory support to identify the barriers and work on those barriers. And this is exactly what I said at the beginning. You need to find the right point on this spectrum between overregulation and underregulation. And here in the US, it's definitely underregulated. Driving is a multi-agent game, right? Your action affects the action of other road users. When you're flying, you're out there alone. And if you're not out there alone, it's really dangerous, right? And I think a self-driving car has two major components. One is sensing in order to build an environmental model, to understand what's around the car, just like a human understands that there's a vehicle, pedestrian, traffic light, and so forth. The second, and, and that I think need not be transparent. Who cares how, does, how it works? What kind of sensors or how it builds an environmental model? It, it's really a, a detail that you don't need to know about. But then comes the second part, which is the decision making. How does the car decide when to change lane? And when it decides to change lane, how does it determine which vehicle to take away, which vehicle to, to, to give way? How does it determine it, its path? Why is that important? Because I'm a human driving driver driving near an autonomous car, and I need to know what kind of decisions this car is making. I know how humans make their decision, but I don't know how this creature makes its decisions. My perspective has been that the, the DOT in the U.S. has actually been quite supportive of the technology uh, and is taking a thoughtful approach where they're putting in place guidelines that provide some of the air cover that I think uh, Amnon is looking for uh, uh, without being overly prescriptive with regulation yet. Right? I think we are, we're not at the point today where the technology exists. Uh, and I think that there is a risk that if we get prescriptive regulation a priori, that we will actually uh, cut off the opportunity to deploy the technology. Yes, not only is it real, but it's a game changer because like all of the shiny objects that we seem to talk about year after year, or unlike, it's, a, it's an enabler. It's an enabler of AR and VR. It's an enabler of AI. It will change. It's a, fundamentally upgrade the entire technology system so it's a platform for innovation that's going to affect the entire economy. We talk about it being real, but it's not 
here. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think the rate at which it's coming is important to consider because, you know, here in the U.S., we were first adopters of 4G, but right now we're being seriously outpaced by Asia in adoption of 5G. 5G requires a 10-year investment cycle to actually make real, to actually hit critical mass. So we have to be serious about making those investments and truly building it out because it exists, but it has to be deployed. Of course, it's the immersive experiences. We are all about brand experience, creating experience, and it will certainly enable that at greater scale and with more power um, and higher fidelity storytelling. But beyond that, what 5G is going to do is allow us to actually access not only this data network effect of having more data, but the truth is that as marketers, for a while now, we've had a lot of data, but all the wrong data. And what I'm most excited about is the ability to connect to and capture emotional data sets for the first time at scale. That, for marketers, is incredibly exciting and powerful. Creative's going to get better. The connection with customers is going to get better. The value you can deliver to your consumers will get so much better. And those emotional data sets I think, again, then fed into AI. AI is only as powerful as the data you're pumping into it. That then will allow us to get to the personalization Jill's talking about. Our mobile consumer study this year said, I thought it was just a staggering insight, that we're going from a world over the next year where a world where we have two to three mobile devices each to a world where we have 40 to 100 each attached to us in some way. So if you think about in the future, we talk about omni-channel and omni-channel world, the air is the new channel, <laughs> right? And you think about yeah. experience much more broadly. Um, I think it will inspire rather than terrify you, which I think is important in a world of very fast-paced innovation. National Geographic has a 130-year legacy in visual storytelling. And you know, so going back to the early 1900s when we augmented our scientific journal with photography, it was leaning into what was next, and it was actually a big, bold move. And it hasn't been a big part of our narrative, but it has been absolutely core to how we have thought about augmenting our storytelling. AI, which you know, is being used in all types of commercial applications, that will continue, and machine learning um, will need to continue to advance for 5G really to be fully you know, viable and usable because you need to be able to author content to be you know, universal across all different kinds of devices. You need to be able to capture the data, synthesize it, and then you know, act upon it and personalize the experiences and make them immersive across all these different types of surfaces.